Welcome to another edition of uh, Practical Show Tech. We're uh, glad everybody's joining us. Uh, we're watching uh, our attendee list build right now. So as we've done in the past, we're just going to give it a few more minutes. Uh, today, um, we're being joined by Ram and by Jonathan from uh, ClearCom again. Uh, we had such an exciting conversation the last time around. We just literally ran out of time. So uh, that's the beauty of the internet. But uh, before we get to uh, today's topic, I am going to uh, throw this over to Pete here. Uh, Pete, we have been going 100 miles an hour <laughs> the last couple of days, just uh, you know, with the conversations uh, yesterday's broadcast about just RF in general. Uh, we're yeah, finding yeah. A, a really popular, and uh, I see you got our website up here. Why don't you kind of walk us through what's what's coming up this week? It's a it's a full one, isn't it? Well, we have about four weeks already scheduled, but we've only posted uh, through the end of next week. Uh, uh, coming on uh, tomorrow, Thursday, um, uh, we're actually today, we're doing this one up at the top here with Ram and Jonathan about basically HelixNet and LQ. Then tomorrow at noon, I'm going to do a little talk about uh, creating my um, uh, webcam. Uh, and making making my pictures for my labels when I label things in in uh, for my intercom belt packs and how I organize my comm stuff. Then that night, Jess Heimlich's going to do a, a a deep dive into Unity Intercom and how it all works and, and what the deal is. It he'll also have the ability for you to actually log on to the server and join him talking on the intercom. So before you get to the webinar, download on your iPhone or on your Android uh, the appropriate app, uh, the client Unity Intercom, uh, which is free on both of them, and he will tell you how to plug how to plug in the uh, uh, the logon when you get there. Uh, then again, we go back to uh, ClearCom is going to do a whole show of free speak, uh, and this is going to be at 1 a.m. for the for you night owls, also for everybody in Asia. Uh, we, he's doing a show at, at 1 a.m. So if you want to stay up late, you can watch that too. Uh, and Eastern. then, well, that's 1 a.m. Eastern. Yes. Sorry. 1 a.m. Eastern, and uh, you do the math wherever you live. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, this next one right here, we just realized it's really not PWS doing the presentation. It's a show about RAD and RF over fiber. So RAD and PWS are. Are, are somewhat connected, but in reality, it's going to be a RAD doing a, a presentation on their RAD intercom system. And then- And it's all uh, RF, again, right? We get a little crazy. All about, we just- All about RF and, and uh, yeah. RF over fiber, their methods of doing RF over fiber. And then uh, again, we'll get back to doing an RF se section with me on how to coordinate when you're on tour, the whole process of what do you do when your truck pulls in, how you get everything going, so you can get all your RF going in five hours uh, in a brand new city. And then uh, we, we come back to uh, ClearCom, back to HelixNet and LQ and Asian IC in the Asian countries at 1 a.m. So basically the same show we're doing right now, we're gonna do it 1 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, for those people who don't who, who are up all night so yeah and i think pretty... here's one of the yeah go uh, ahead one thing i just like to throw in there pete is uh one of the reasons we're trying to do these yeah we could rebroadcast that and of course all these videos are available in our archive at practicalshowtech.com in the archive section but we're finding the q a time is so so powerful with what we're going on uh we got awesome questions the last time we were with rom and uh, Jonathan, every every session. And so we wanna extend that out to everybody that we can to do that. One thing I did note, uh, Pete, on your session is that uh, you've got some possible required reading. It's not required, but there's a download in, uh, available. There is a link, uh, there, is a link there, which you can access directly on that uh, uh, thing there. And it basically was a book I wrote on my whole process of doing RF coordination on tour. And I sort of wrote it when I was out to Tim McGraw and Faith Hill 
And it goes from walking out of the out of the bus at 8 a.m. doing my coordination, getting my stuff all ready and loading all my wireless all the way through to the end of the show and packing it up, and getting back in the bus and maybe sleeping for a couple of hours. Well, there you go. And and so so we're we're doing our best to to make sure that you have um not just hearing from from uh, all the various uh, voices in the market today, but also trying to get you some some information. And so that I think will segue into what we've got going today. Like um, last time we were with uh, both Ram and Jonathan, uh, there are handouts available uh, in the control panel. Pete, why don't you just kind of talk us through our handouts, our chat windows and, and questions, things like that. Sure. Well, uh, on it, it sort of displays a little differently whether you're using Crown Chrome or you're using Firefox. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, in in uh, Chrome, you have a separate little window with things you can do, like your your uh, a dashboard, uh, your webcam, your audio, different th options depending on what level you're logged on. Basically, the handouts is the important one. And the questions is the other important one. So if you pull down the little arrow with questions, you can then type in a question. Now, uh, Harlan is online with us, Harlan Erskine, my son, and he's going to be basically vetting these questions and or answering them if he can. If you have a question about using the webinar, he can certainly answer those questions really quickly. And then as questions come in that work uh, into the subject that Ram and Jonathan are gonna be talking about, uh, I'll probably pop in now and then and uh, uh, bring up those questions so they don't have to necessarily watch them so closely. Yeah, uh, right fine. below right below that is a bunch of things like the LQ setup docs, the ClearCom Word Tour class, syllabus, uh, Helix and hardware handouts, a bunch of different documents, which Ram is basically going to go over some of right now. And there you go. So that's a pretty good segue. Um, hey, Mac, uh, we'll just wave to Mac real quick. We we kind of bypassed him earlier, but thanks for joining us, Mac. He's uh, He's been getting his early morning AM uh, gigs in uh, for his webcast and then coming and uh, hopping online. So thank you for that. And uh, Ram and Jonathan, um, we're going to turn it over to you and, uh, and uh, look forward to some uh, exciting Helix Net LQ discussions. So take it away, my friends. Ram, I'm oh, going to throw the uh, sharing screen over to you now. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Well, uh, so we're going to um, we're going to start out with just some basics. First of all, we want to talk about the uh, the components that are in uh, HelixNet and LQ. We'll get to LQ a little bit later. We'll first start with HelixNet. Uh, HelixNet, obviously, uh, most of you know, is a digital party line system. So you know, we all came up using the old um, ClearCom party line system or the RTS uh, party line system. It's a two-wire system that has uh, power and uh, duplex comms for one or more channels uh, on a three-pin XLR. Um, and it serves us all well. You know, you just plug it in and it works and it's really simple. Um, over the about 10 years ago, ClearCom came up with this idea that, uh, you know, we needed to bring it to the next level. The, the live performance people were starting to use more and more channels, um, and uh, we wanted something that was easy to deploy and upgradable, but still um, enable the facilities to continue to use the cable infrastructure that was uh, set. Um, everything was running XLR. So uh, our engineers came up with the HelixNet product, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with and have used. And uh, let me say first that we have a wide audience here. Typically, uh, when Jonathan and I and everybody here uh, uh, presents, we can sort of read the room and see who's got what kind of experience level. Um, obviously, we're having issues with that because uh, you can see me, but I can't see you. Um, so take advantage of the question um, uh, area there so you can tell us if we're dumbing it down or we're diving too deep at any particular time and we'll try to adjust. Okay, thanks. 
Um, Ram, so, Ram, if could I interrupt for a moment, if when yeah. you share your screen, if you could share a specific window instead of your entire screen, right? We now we've got your whole email on the screen and everything. So, oh, how cool is pull, that? Oh, that's not what I that little, That's no, not just pull I'm down doing. and select just something that's uh, yeah, yeah, a sorry. So sorry, so sorry. Okay, so um, let me see which is the one that I want to show. I apologize for that. Um, I'm new at this, so uh, be gentle, everybody. Okay, so here we go. How's that? So we're looking now at some of the HelixNet product line, and in that product line, you're seeing here uh, the 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 front. Uh, do you see my cursor, by the way, moving across like that? Anybody? We yeah, do. we see it fine. We see cool. it fine. Okay. It's good. That's lovely. Okay, so we're we're looking now at the HelixNet um, master station, which is uh, you know that's what we use to set all this up. There's the new belt pack, which uh, some of you are familiar with, some of you are not. You might be still using that old uh, um, car radio amplifier looking thing with the fins for uh, heat abatement. And over here, we're showing the wall station. Um, many of you remember the, the KB uh, uh, unit that we've had for almost 50 years now. KB, by the way, a little piece of trivia, KB stands for King Biscuit. The King Biscuit flower hour was, um, was exploded when the hippies all started listening to it. And so, um, we had a, uh, uh, Charlie Button went out there and took the guts of a belt pack and took a King Biscuit tin and uh, made some holes in it, put the ear cup of the ear uh, of the headset under the holes and broke off the gooseneck mic and stuck it in top and then put the guts of the belt pack in the bottom. And they called that the King Biscuit box. And to this day, all of our products like that are called KB for King Biscuit. And even anybody in audio, when they put a throw down even if it's just a listen box, like a Fostec speaker or an anchor speaker, they call it a biscuit. So there you go, a little piece of trivia that'll get you a beer in a bar one day. Um, now, the, the main station and the remote station look very similar, um, except the main station has sort of a pizza box form factor, um, and the remote station only is about two or three inches deep. Uh, because it doesn't have to do all the stuff that we're going to talk about in a minute here. Um, so one of the things I want to do, I'm going to switch for a second here, just for a second, and show you if I can find it, because I'm not the most organized person in the world here. Uh, where is my... Uh, hmm, sorry about this. Okay, here we go. So that's all the products that are right there. So on top, we're seeing the uh, the new uh, HX2BP, which is the designation of the new belt pack. And you'll see here, I'm going to just make this a little bigger. Uh, you can see that uh, it has an XLR connector, a three-pin XLR connector for standard plugging into the power line modem, which we'll talk about in a second, or a network connection, an RJ45 connector, which you can use uh, with a PoE switch. It's either or. We no longer have, like we had with the older units down here, we no longer have the uh, male and female XLR for daisy chaining. So if you did want to daisy chain while using the, party, uh, the PLM, the power line modem, you would use a, a Y cord. Obviously, with a network connection, you need a switch or a hub to be able to um, make more than one connection. You can't daisy chain those things. Over here on the right-hand side, we, that's the standard four-pin XLR connector that we use for the um, for the headset. You can buy these with five pin female connectors. Uh, for those of you who are used to using the RTS or a lot of uh, CCUs have those sort of connectors. Uh, and you can also get a seven pin connector that's used in, um, we see it a lot in military applications. Obviously it's nothing that I think anybody here has signed up for. And of course there's also a USB C, I'm uh, sorry, a USB micro connector here. It's not a USB-C, it's a USB micro. It doesn't have the curved edges as you normally uh, would see. So when you're connecting the micro connector, you would use, uh, if, if anybody, you know, well, you're all familiar with the USB micro, it has on the bottom of it, it looks almost like two little teeth or two protrusions. Those teeth would face towards the middle of the belt pack as you plug it in. 
and that's how that works. So that's the um, that's the belt pack. Obviously, the you see now the pizza box that I was talking about before that the main station has. The uh, remote station would only be about one quarter as deep as that. Again, because it doesn't have to have as much um, stuff. Or, there's not as much guts to it. Um, this is the back plane. Uh, the back plane. Many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this back plane. Whoa, there we go. This back plane, of course, has an IEC connector for power. Uh, there's no on-off switch, so the on-off switch is pull the power cord. It also has a, a DB25 female on the back for uh, GPIO. Um, all this, by the way, is in the manual, all the pinouts, and the pinouts you'll also find in the handout. Just to the right of that is a quarter-inch uh, tip ring sleeve, which you could use as a hot mic. Very often, um, people want to use IFB with a system like this, and as we all know, the latency of a digital system is not the friendliest to IFBs that want to be somewhat instant. So um, what we normally recommend is that you uh, buy an analog IFB system and you could take the hot mic out of your master station, come out of that and go into the uh, IFB analog system to be able to control that for your IFBs. Next off, we have what we find in many, many products is uh, a male XLR 3 pin that's a stage announce or a, commonly called a voice of God output. And then there's uh, the program in, the female XLR. Program in to HelixNet, as we will elaborate later, is a little bit different than we're used to some of the other analog products where you can attach program in to a channel but the endpoint, and the, by endpoint, I mean anything that attaches to the master station. So a belt pack, either the old ones or the new ones, or a remote station or a wall station, any of those devices can have control over that, um, over that party line volume separately from the channel, unlike in the conventional analog party line where it's locked in. So whatever ratio you've set at the master station is what everybody on that channel is going to hear. In this case, the program audio that you associate with a channel that uh, whoever needs it will get, and you can associate it with multiple channels, um, that can be individually controlled by the endpoint. So if I'm listening to program audio and then I decide I don't need to listen to it anymore, I can turn that down at the belt pack or the remote station. Just to the right of that, you see these four XLRs. Now in the real world, this picture was taken uh, when we were still in what we call pilot in the manufacturer's world. That's when we were testing the boxes before we actually manufactured them. Now you would see a male XLR and a female XLR followed by another male XLR and another female XLR. And you'll note, you see down here, it says power line one and power line two. So let me stop a second and talk about what the power lines are and how they work. The power line modem or what we call PLM is how we transport the digital data to the belt packs and endpoints over microphone cable. One note I will say here, and uh, I'll reiterate it over and over again, there are certain cables which we just don't recommend you use. They're not really suitable for digital, uh, for, for HelixNet Digital Intercom. That's Canary Star Quad or AES um, uh, cable, AES microphone cable. Um, I know our friends at Riedel actually uh, do recommend that cable for their product. It's a little bit too, too high in a capacitance for, for our product to work properly. So those are the two kind of cables you want to stay away from. And we'll talk a little bit about more, a little more about cables coming up. Anyway, we have two power lines on each master station. And the master stations are the only devices that will generate the PLM. Each PLM can have 10 belt packs attached to it. So obviously, since I have two power line modems, I can have 20 belt packs that I can attach to a HelixNet master station. However, there are two budgets that are within the HelixNet uh, system that we need to be cognizant of. One is the PLM budget, that's 10 belt packs per, uh, 
power line. And the other is the data budget. There can be, if you're not using the power line as a power source, you can have 60, that's six zero endpoints on a HelixNet system. And doesn't make a difference how many master stations you've linked together. That's, if you have three master stations linked together, it's still considered one system. Now, just between all of us people, I will tell you that uh, you can probably, there's some wiggle room there. It could be a little bit more than 60, but our published uh, data budget is for 60 endpoints. So if I, for example, plug in a wall station, one of these, or a, a, a remote station into a power line, it will suck the power, the, the current voltage, uh, of the equivalent of three or four bell packs. And I say three or four bell packs because when you turn the speaker on, on a wall station or a remote station, and as you turn the volume up, you're drawing more current. So just using a headset on one of these devices, you would be drawing about three bell packs worth of current. If you turn the speaker on and turn the volume up, now you're drawing about four bell packs worth of current. So real world practice, if I plug one of these devices with an XLR cable into the, into the power line modem, I would want to budget only about three or four more belt packs on that power line. However, if I would connect that, uh, that uh, device, that endpoint, with its wall wart, with its 24 volt wall wart, the DC wall wart that comes with the device, I have now removed that uh, device from the power line budget and it's only added to the data budget. So if I plug this into an XLR cable, but also plug in the, the wall wart power that comes with it, I am only using one device worth of budget and I can still put nine more bell packs on that power line. I hope that's quick. clear. And if, and if not, yeah, go ahead. Uh, quick question: Does your 60 bell pack limit per system, whatever number of bases you have on there, apply mm -hmm. if if they're networked and or power yes. line? Yes, and that's a good question. So it's when I say 60 endpoints, it's not just the bell packs. It could be remote stations. It could be a, another linked base station. Uh, it could be the wall station. It could be belt packs of either uh, of either type, the old ones or the new ones. That's a data budget. So you can have 60 endpoints in a system, again, no matter how many uh, master stations you have attached to it. The power line modem budget is 20 per master station. So if I link three master stations together, in one system, each one giving me 20 belt packs worth of, uh, of uh, power line modem budget, I can plug 60 belt packs in there or the belt pack equivalent if I'm using uh, any of the other endpoints that draw more power. Uh, is that a little bit clearer? Yeah, I, I was just asking if it also applied when you're putting uh, belt packs on a network. Because the uh, last show I was on, I put out, I only had one base. I put out 20 belt packs in the local video area. And mm -hmm. then I ran two switches to either mm -hmm. side of the stage. And mm -hmm. I didn't have over 60 total, but I just wondered if that was also a limiting factor. So really, it's total of bases, uh, uh, bases. speaker stations, belt packs. Yes. Total of 60 items. Right. We, okay. we Clearcom and several other places I've heard it also, we call them endpoints. So there can be 60 devices. The data budget for a system is 60 devices. And again, there's some wiggle room there. If you have 63, I'm sure it's going to work. Um, but the power line budget is for devices that are drawing current from the power line modem. Um, let me just backtrack a second and talk a moment about Powerline Modem. Powerline Modem was originally designed, um, it's actually, it's, it's kind of old technology. 
if if you can remember back in the Stone Age before we all had uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all that stuff in our home, if you had a computer in your office, in your home office, and you wanted to have another network connection in your den, you would have to run a piece of Cat5 from your router to your den. However, what you could do is you could go and buy, and they have them at Best Buy and just all over the place, Amazon has them, they call them power line modems. You plug it into your electrical socket, and as long as the other room is on the same electrical circuit, you can then take the um, uh, another box just like it and plug it into the electrical uh, Edison plug in the other room. You plug the uh, one that's in your home office, there's a, a RJ45 and you connect to it. And it, what it does is it runs the network data of your system through the Romex cable in your house. And then the device at the other end demuxes it strips the AC power off and uh, is it enables you to then have a network connection in the other room. So that's what power line modem is and that's the that's the 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 technology that we're using in this power line modem. I've heard of one, people one more, not like one more one more quick question on quantity. Yep. Yep. Do LQ devices on the network count toward data devices if I have two LQ interfaces on my network yes. for the helix yes, net they, yes they do yes so they do. I, if i put on two the lqs i then can have 58 and, and one base and you know three bases and i can only have uh 55 bell packs yeah that's okay it, yeah again there's wiggle room we've actually tested this beyond 60 but the published amount in the data uh, budget is 60. I uh, don't want anybody to be afraid of trying to stretch it a little bit. Okay, but the power line modem is not stretchable. Um, also, the power line modem, the XLR connectors, um, the lower the capacitance of the cable and the higher the gauge typically will give you um, much, much, much better um, uh, cable length. So if you've got a really long run, you may want to use some very high quality cable. Now, having said that, uh, in your handouts, in the appendix in your handouts, you'll find that there is a, um, a drawing. It's the Phillips standard for connecting category cable to an XL, a three pin XLR. And I'll just tell you that if you want to write this down, but you do have a, it, it's in the handout and it's available and I'm always happy to send it to you or tell you about it. But very quickly, if we're using 568B wiring, which we normally are, and it's a shielded, it must be a shielded uh, Cat5 cable. Cat5E is fine, doesn't have to be Cat6. A shielded Cat5E, the, both the brown and the white brown, you would put to pin three of, I'm sorry, you would put to pin one of the XLR. And all the solid colors, the solid blue, solid green, solid orange, would go to pin two of the XLR, and the white, uh, white green, white blue, and white orange would go to pin three of the XLR, and the shield would go to the shell of the XLR, and has to be connected to the shell at both ends, because there's, you know, definitely we don't want any of this uh, stuff to leak out through the cable. Now, on the so on the length on the length of cable, what's what's the longest cable you can run? for a power line use and okay. uh, is there any advantage to powering remotely okay so powering remotely is not a possibility at this time we don't make like we do with the encore uh two wire party line product we don't make a throw down power supply that will boost the power at the other end it's in the works uh but it's nothing that's going to come out anytime soon i can tell you that um you can go on 18 gauge low capacitance microphone cable you can go about a thousand feet with little issue i wouldn't want to put my entire show on that in other words i wouldn't want to put 10 bell packs on that for each power line modem but if you need a few bell packs that far out you could do it you could probably go about 1200 feet or maybe a little bit more by using what i just said by using um 
high quality shielded Cat 5e with the Philips standard to the XLRs. That gives you, because of the, of the nulling qualities in the twisted pairs within the cable, it makes for a little bit um, more organized uh, uh, power at the other end. Now, an AES, a CAT cable is essentially an AES uh, is 110 ohm, but also right. in your, Dave Zamet points out that your cable calculator on your website shows Canary DA206 uh, as the best spec for power line connection via XLR, but that's an uh, AES cable. So what's the deal with AES? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that, and I I was told very early on that we that we didn't want to use the 110 ohm because it's very high capacitance. Um, the 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 table that you're referring to is actually in the document that's provided here in the appendix, or or I think it's actually in the HelixNet section, which starts on page 20 of of these uh, world tour handouts. I am I'm at a loss. I, I I'm going to have to get back on that. Um, uh, Jonathan, you have you had any experience with the AES cable in uh, HelixNet? Uh, I have not. Uh, standard XLR on my end. Yeah, I would uh, I would want to consult with Kari and or uh, Charlie Button on that one. Uh, you know, we never know. Uh, I'm, I I I I don't know for a fact that um, that 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 cable has. Uh, that cable chart has been blessed by the people who uh, are in the know. But if you say that 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 model of Canary is uh, 110, then you know I'm I put my faith in you uh, very much, Dr. Erskine. That's uh, that's news to me, and I will shake that tree. Sorry about that. The the question that was asked about USB powering the bell packs may have been a confusion because in the older version of the bell packs there is a USB connector on and there the is side. A new one. There is on a new one. It's on which the is not which is not for powering the bell pack. No. It, it is, is for not. outputting DC for a signal light. And here's right. something I use. This is an LED uh USB cable, regular USB to mini USB, and you can plug it in the mini USB end into your bell pack and have a signaling cable for it. It's uh huh. Okay, that's interesting. Can you show that again? Because I was buried deep in my uh, my my little PowerPoint there, and I didn't see what you showed. Oh yes, that of course. Yeah. So yeah, that's for call. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, your your mic's muted, um, Peter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lots of lots of these cables come with lights and they, uh, you yep. just find one with a with a micro usb on one end and a regular usb on the other end and it works pretty well yeah those are cool yeah we're going to talk about that in just a little bit the call signal thing was a very interesting and very welcome uh adaptation that we made in the second version that didn't come out the door like that but it certainly is uh is there okay so uh let's see am i still showing that you still see my uh yeah, there we it is. We still have, there we go. Uh, there we go, okay. All right, so um, the S-mount, as you can see, that's how you can take one of the wall plates, the wall stations, and actually um, stick it on a little desktop stand. The nice thing about this desktop stand is if you if you push in that little uh, ClearCom um, button on the side, uh, it will it, it actuates a ratchet that allows you to fold it down or at any angle that you like. When it's all the way down, uh, you can stack them. They've got little feet that are designed to stack for transportation, and it's kind of useful. Also, uh, updating the firmware, as I indicated here in the lower right, is pretty easy. There are a lot of ways to do it. The first way we did it was with a USB stick. Now, of course, since we have the GUI, uh, the browser-based GUI, um, you can do it through the GUI, and uh, it's very useful. So yeah, so you, what you were talking about uh, on the side of the old belt packs, they had a little rubber a rubber uh, door that you could pull off and 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 get that uh, that uh, micro USB. And now there's that same flap that's shown. It's the flap has been opened, and you can see it. It um, it shows you the uh, 
the micro USB connector for what you were just talking about. So, you know, I've, I've had I've had producers and stage managers uh, and audio people particularly ask me if it's okay to use the USB connector on the front of their base station to charge their phone. Well, yeah, yeah, but um, it's going to draw power from the power line modem. Uh, a lot of people have done it, and I've heard of shows that have sort of come down because of that. So I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, people often confuse the fact that in the, the FreeSpeak belt pack, you, you can actually plug into the uh, micro connector to power a belt pack up. Um, however, that's not the case with HelixNet. Um, so there you go. One thing I do want to add is those slots on the side at, uh, that, that you see here on the bottom, these are not hot swappable. So if you need to take out or install these slots, uh, you want to pull that power cord over here and power down the system. What these slots are for, and we make several different kinds, are for um, I.O. to be able to connect other devices to your HelixNet system. So, for example, uh, the one that we're showing here, again, this picture was taken while we were still in pilot, so it's, it's, not, it's not designated as the EE2N anymore. It's the ETH2. This is a, a, a module that's used to connect your system, your HelixNet base station, into a network. And you'll see there are two RJ45s. It's, that's so you can loop through. That's not two NICs. It's so, for example, if I wanted to plug into my network, but I also wanted to plug my laptop into that network, I don't have to go to the switch. I can just plug my laptop into that second connector and be able to talk to and through the system. These other two slots could be populated with uh, four wire uh, uh, modules that will allow us to connect to any other device, whether it's Clearcom, Riedel, RTS, anybody else, um, uh, Studio Technologies, any of the other uh, 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 systems that use four wire, which is standard line level in and out. Um, in your handouts, uh, we also have uh, a connector that will show you. As a matter of fact, I'll show you here. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing. Are you seeing this uh, pinout right now? No, you're not. I've got to do this. Excuse me. I'm sorry again. Standard disclaimers. I'm new at this. Okay, so it's the. Uh, I think it's this one. Yep, there we go. So you see that uh, Word document there. And again, these are in your handouts also. Um, this is, if I can take an RJ45, and again, considering that I'm using the standard uh, 568B wiring, uh, and I can send the, the, the pin out here, the green pair and the blue pair, to um, XLR connectors. This would be to a male XLR because the green pair is the output of that, uh, of that R, uh, RJ45 uh, connector. And the blue pair is the input to that RJ45 connector that we saw in the base station before. Um, over here, it shows you the pinout that's our standard for base station wiring, uh, the, the, uh, the Cat5, again, using 568B wiring. So this adapter that you could make could work for a HelixNet base station. It could work for an LQ base station. It could work for a FreeSpeak 2 base station. Um, the HelixNet base station, unlike the FreeSpeak and the HelixNet, does not have the software trick to be able to flip those. So you need to follow this scheme in order to go in and out if you're using XLRs to that uh, RJ45 connector. Um, that's sadly just a fact of life. And, um, you know, maybe in the next, in our next life, we'll be able to come up with that uh, a little bit better. Okay. Question, question about belt packs. Um, mm -hmm. With the old belt packs, yep. uh, some belt packs, I don't know which one he's thinking about. Frank Musgrove is wondering how you can do a foot pedal on it, like on the BP325 belt packs, you can connect a foot pedal to it to, 
to trigger it. Is yeah. there any way to do a foot pedal on one of these belt packs? Well, there's kind of a cheap and dirty way to do it. Um, and you have to play around and I don't have the drawing with me uh, or the, or the, uh, the, I can't remember what it was a diode or a cap that we stuck in there, but you see these, uh, these four pins on the headset connector, pin one and two, pin one and two is minus and plus for the mic and pin three and four is minus and plus for the ear. So what some people do is they take a female XLR four pin, plug it into here, pull out pins one and two, send it to a foot switch, again, with that cap, and I can't remember what the value is. Um, and it's just to prevent popping from when you hit it. And then three and four, they just pass through to the other uh, three and four male XLR that they then plug their headset into. Um, as far as for the for the belt pack to be able to do that, that's the only way to do it for a belt pack. Obviously, on the back plane of a master station, a remote station, you do have this uh, uh, a D sub uh, connector on the back. On the on the back of the remote stations, it would be a DB. I think it's a DB nine, not a DB twenty five. There are ways for you to um, hook that that mic. Uh, kill foot switch onto there but that's for the belt pack there's really no clean way to do it um yeah i'm not I, i'm not sure the gpi on the base can trigger a mic on a belt pack i think there's a i think there's well i have to double check i believe there is a mic switch there i'll have to look um, while I'm looking particularly stupid, maybe Jonathan could look that up and see if I'm how moronic I'm being here. Uh, by the way, the CC 300, 400 headsets or the 110, 220 headsets, when you raise the boom up, it will cut the mic. Obviously, that's you're not going to do that with your foot, but uh, it just reminded me that I did want to say that that's a possibility for that product. Unfortunately, it does click when you do that. What clicks? When you raise the boom in a in a electric powered. Oh, electric mic powered. You know? Yeah. Well, that this particular microphone is dynamic, so it's this this particular headset has a dynamic mic, so there's no pop. But yes, with an electric mic, that would be um, annoying. That would be annoying for sure. Um, okay, so I went over that hot swappable. That's very important. And there's a little note here. And again, this is page 21 of your Hill Mills that we that we uh, provided for you. There's the note that says there's a power line modem budget and there's a data budget. And that's just uh, to review. That's going to be very important for what we're doing. Okay. Hey, Ron, before we drift too far away. Yes, sir. Uh, and up and yes there is local control for the base for talk triggering mm -hmm. but as of right now uh, in line for the bell pack side there may so be so that other the, logic the gpi here. can trigger mics on the base but not uh, any bell pack on the system that's correct yes okay. not that now that being said there's you know things we can do to make tricks but there'd have to be a pretty good case for it by the way, I do want to mention something, and I don't know where it is in the in in the handout, but you see these Ethercon connectors. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Ethercon, it kind of looks like an XLR, but it's actually an RJ45 connector. And we do this so that you have uh, continuity on the shield all the way through the connection. Plus, it gives you strain relief, as you all know. You got to push that button over there to be able to disconnect an XLR cable. So it makes it a little bit um, harder to pull out in case somebody trips on the cable. Not all Ethernet, uh, Ethercon connectors are created equal. Uh, you'll find in the handouts, and I can't offhand remember exactly where I put it, uh, but I know I put a document into the tips folder that will be distributed to everybody. Um, there is a, 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 a a connector, I don't know, I think Noitix makes it, or maybe Switchcraft makes it, that um, is for sale on the B&H uh, website. 
that is not compatible with standard EtherCon connectors. What happens is you see this is a round hole here. What they do is they square it off on the sides. And I don't know what it's for or who it's for, but it ain't for us. So just be cognizant of that if you're buying EtherCon cables with connectors that they're the standard type. Okay. I believe also there's an EtherCon CAT6 cable, which is a different diameter XLR connector. Mac, would you know about that? Mac, still with us? Kelly, do you know about that? I am not familiar with that one, no. Yeah, I have run into it. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that... actually it's not made anymore. I, I think it... Okay. I think they realized what that what the problem was and they stopped making that. But I know at least for a while there was a EtherCon CAT6 cable that was not compatible with the rest of the EtherCon connectors. So here you go. Here I think I just saw it. Oh, where did it go? I think it's right it up on my screen here, um, showing the visual for you. Okay. Uh, let me stop my screen. Oh, there you go. You got you're showing it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can see here's the inside of the shell has that square fitting on it. So it's the yeah. diameter outside that doesn't fit in. And Whereas, almost all the manuf almost all the manufacturers are not using that. So just be right. careful when you buy the EtherCon connector. This is the kind you want. Yep. This is the standard shell ring. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Let me get back to my. Uh, Little who's a dingle here. So uh, where was I? I? I went I I went walkabout here on my uh, my panel. I think it says 34. Let me let's see if that does it. Whoops. Yeah, this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier. This is the Phillips standard uh, pinout for the uh, uh, shielded Cat5 for XLR. Um, so you see the shield of the cable goes to the shell of the XLR connector. The orange, white, orange, and orange goes to pin one. All the other solid colors go to pin two. And um, pin three, which is this, boy, this, uh, I think this diagram is a little funky because it looks like it's the, the pins are backwards. But as long as you go to the pin two with the solids, you'll be fine. Okay. And um, that's for you know really long runs of power line modem. You really want to use this kind of a cable. So it to me it looks wrong. Go back to that diagram there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it, it, that because your your pair, like your pair your pair is four five is a pair twisted pair, and you're showing them going to pin two and three, which makes uh, which makes sense if they're two different channels. And then you have four and seven, which yeah. are not a twisted pair. Okay. So or let, seven. So hang on you a know. second. Let me let me see if I can find this. Yes, you're correct. So let me say this about that. Okay. Um, well, that's RTS. But in a, in in the power line modem XLR, pin one is your ground common. Pin two is plus, I believe pin two is plus 30 volts and pin three is minus 30 volts that we cleverly make to not 60 volts, but 59.5. And the reason is um, that if it's 60 volts of DC, now you need an electrician's license to wire things up and that costs a lot of money. So we brought it down to 59.5 volts. So all of us normal, you know, B flat crew pukes can set up a system now. Um, so the, the, that's why we put all the, 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 the solids to pin two and the white, uh, the striped ones to pin three. Does that answer your question, uh, Pete? Well, I, I can see that makes sense in that it's easier to wire it because it's obvious to look for the whites versus the solids. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in reality, you're intermixing twisted pairs versus non-twisted pairs. Oh, yeah, but they're, pairs. but they're nulling each other out in the twists, is my uh, understanding. I don't know. Chubby Checker would say you can't do the twist like this, so. <laughs> okay. Well, 
All right. Interesting story about Chubby Checker and Fats Domino. We can get to at some other point. Um, let's see. There was the other thing I wanted to show. Where to go? Did I even put it there yet? Uh, I'm sorry. Please excuse me. Um, let's see. Can you see? Let me see if I can do this. Can you see this document here? No, you can't. So I have to show my. Hmm. I'm sorry. Give me one more second here. Flash or is that in the in the list here? Yeah, there it is. Sorry about that. So you were talking about this before, uh, Pete, where we don't have a call light like we have in the regular two-wire analog party line system front of house guys and gals like a call light because they don't want to wear a headset they want to use a handset and they need to be alerted when somebody needs to talk to them now in the standard analog world uh, what we would do is we would take one of these call light boxes and daisy chain it from the belt pack that that operator was using to the call light and when a call signal came in on that um, channel then um then it would be um you would see the call happen on that channel you'd see the light or the buzz or whatever you wanted to do there um what we did because now on that one single xlr cable you've got 12 channels plus program audio going there so um what we what we did is instead of building a, a, a flasher box that would cost as much as a belt pack because it has to be able to demux all the channels, we just used the existing um, micro USB connector that is on that belt pack. And um, if you if you go, you can go to Amazon and buy them or whatever, and um, you can see these um, you can see these. That connector there or that connector there with one of these adapter, it's a micro USB to a female USB. And then you go down here and you can get any old USB uh, LED flasher or the really cool disco one that uh, Peter was showing you before. And you go into the programming and for that role, for that, for that key set, and we're gonna talk about all this in a minute, for that key set, it allows you to make the left key set could be solid and the right key set could be blinking. So the operator at a glance knows which button to push to respond to a call. So we're gonna to have to get into the, the GUI for a little bit. And um, for that, uh, Jonathan, do you wanna drive a GUI or do you wanna leave it here? Yeah, I can drive on a GUI. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're looking at one right now. Can everybody see the screen well enough? You should be able to expand it. Mm -hmm. um, so to follow through with ROMs, you can do this from the front panel. Um, obviously, you know it's 2020, everybody prefers a GUI. The ethernet module in my mind should really just be an automatic with the HelixNet just to really open up the, the capabilities of the GUI and some of the IP stuff that we're gonna talk about in a bit. Um, but in the GUI for that USB flasher, super simple. You go into your roles, find one of your belt pack roles, or if you want, you could select multiples, or we could select all of them, and we can change our USB flasher mode um, right here from that channel assignment. So again, we could say left channel, channel one is gonna be uh, solid, and channel two will want blinking. So again just real quick gives us a way to go into the system and define that um, at a, a global level pete your mic's off can't hear you pete Wait. is there a call light available on the speaker station as well call light output no no not for the speaker station or the uh, or the or the remote station. Sadly, no. Well, well, the 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 four channel station doesn't the light flash the 
key flash? Yeah, so on a on a remote station or on a the main station itself, yeah, you get, you get the, HK, the call indicator on the front. The HKB2 would get the call light on the button, like a normal call light. Yeah. I mean, That's correct. But, yep. but not an external call light. Okay, fine. Thank you. Right. Sorry about my mic. No, thanks for the question. Clarification. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, Jonathan, why don't you go through, uh, as I turn my hat around, why don't you go through this, uh, the GUI for a bit for everybody? Sure. We'll take a 30,000 flyover on it. Um, again, overview stuff here. It's just nice to get a good look um, over your system. I'm probably telling you guys things you already know, but um, again, just a really good visual so you can see uh, your link grouping here on devices. So if we were to add another master station, we would see it come into this two slot. Um, a third device, maybe we add an LQ into the chain. Um, we can set those, those members um, to come into the CCM so that we can manage everything in one central unified location. Um, we can also see anything connected locally to this HelixNet. And if we had other devices in the linking, which we can see later, um, we would be able to see some status reports from those devices as well. Um, so a good home page here. You can always jump around um, from that overview page if you're looking for a specific unit. Uh, we're looking for a remote station. We can jump right to those things. Um, we can get you know, kind of a shortcut into where the config is for that device. Uh, next tab over, device. This is your high level uh, programming system setup. Um, the name obviously here, you can leave it default. You can give it a nice clever name. Uh, it's just for you and how you're organizing your shows. Uh, if we wanted to make a change here, um, we could call this our demo system, or we could call this unit one in a mix if we wanted to. Um, checkbox changes, X bails out. Uh, host name is hard coded in for now, um, so we can leave that. Uh, the select role here um, is for selecting a role for that system. By default, it will go to a local config. Uh, when we talk about roles, we can talk about how to create kind of a custom setup for, for the device. Um, two important things here on this page are the HMS H4X version. That is the base code version. So that is the firmware that the unit's running, um, as well as the belt pack version displayed here as well. Uh, biggest things to note here is we really just want to make sure these match. So if you're in a rental scenario, if you have somebody coming in or out of your house, or if you're going in or out of somebody else's house, um, and you are intermixing equipment, it is good hygiene um, to go through and check to make sure all of your endpoints uh, match what that base version is. If things are off, um, they can cause issues, they might not connect, or um, you might end up with a, just a bigger meltdown on the system. Uh, other good tabs in here that are hidden, uh, save and restore is great. Um, I saw a question in there about an offline editor. As of right now, it's all online changes. Um, we do have some offline um, systems that uh, used to uh, be hosted on the web for that reason. Uh, they are currently in transition between teams. So once those things are up, hopefully you'll see something on our website. Um, but if you are comfortable with a good starting point on a system and you've got things where you like it, by all means, do a save here. Bring that with you on a USB to all your shows, and you can at least easily load that in. Um, keep in mind those configs do go back to the expansion modules that are in there. Uh, they can go back to endpoints. Um, and sometimes you might jump versions enough where you see some differences there. So keep you in know, mind that. What, what you're saying about offline programming, it's not really offline programming. You're saying some people, ClearCom included, have available a system online for you to do some initial programming right now my question for that when you do that initial programming let's say you set up your assignments and your roles on a device that's located at clearcom will that file load correctly into another device yeah the, the file should load you're not going to see any of the hardware so anything as far as uh, role assignments to belt packs, role assignments to physical um, devices. Um, most of that should be lost, but you, you should get the roles and you should get um, a base level of assignment names and everything. And you can get certainly the I.O. 
assignments to the assignments. Correct. Yeah. And again, assuming, anything that doesn't have to do with the device. Right. Right. And again, assuming, you know, that, you know, the the device was set up the same virtually so it had the same four wire module the same expansion modules for two wire or for the uh, ethernet right right um, so it assume you know there, there are some hardware dependencies there but as far as a base setup goes for this is what i want to call my belt packs belt pack one or sam jim steve um, it can give you at least an edge going forward um, always good to uh, just do a save as you know you set up your your system for that first day of the show do a save as, save it. That way you can always get back to something if you do have to do a reset or a, a version upgrade for any reason. Uh, change password here. This is for the CCM. Uh, there are changes coming. Uh, state of California shipping um, devices out of that state uh, is no longer going to allow admin admin or pass pass or anything generic for um, CCM passwords. So what we're gonna end up seeing here is um, obviously buy something new, uh, there'll be a little code in there that says it's this leading and it ends with uh, the last five or six of your serial. Um, but you why, can always- Why is that? They're afraid too many people will be using uh, default passwords? Yeah, it's just a, it's a compliance thing. Um, you know, there are so many manufacturers um, who are out there, so many customers, so many people at home who are using um, these open-ended systems that can openly communicate and it's a security thing so that if somebody happens to see this ip up in my my browser and they happen to find out on another page on this unit what my external ip is they can now get into that device and they can see that information they can make changes so it's just a security measure out of the gate to make sure that we're eliminating as much possibility as we can of anybody getting to the, the Linux level of the device. But we're will it be gonna... simple enough that uh, Clearcom will actually print the password for that device on the back of that piece of hardware? Or do yeah, we have so to it'll... go look through the, uh, the, the manual to find it? No, it'll be, um, there's, there, there'll be a little cheat sheet with it. Um, each device is a little different. Um, I forget what the code is for HelixNet, but it's something along the lines of HMS dash a few, like the last six of your serial number. Um, so something that will be easy to find. Um, you can always come in here and you can punch that password in and you can change it to admin again, if you would like. That is your choice to make. Uh, we just can't ship it that way anymore. So um, if you see anything out in the field, it's still gonna be admin admin but you can come in here and change that if you feel more comfortable. Most of the stuff that's out there is um, uh, is still with the old scheme of admin admin. Uh, new products coming out the door with new firmware coming forward will have that. So if you try admin admin, um, if it's a base station, you can go into the administration menu and you'll find the MDNS number that you need uh, to be able to use that password for the first time. And what I always do is just, I just shift it back to uh, admin because I'm stupid and it's really easy to remember. That's fair enough. Um, the licenses on here um, is basically for the channel count on the unit. Um, most of the time out of the box, you're never gonna have to touch anything with that. But if you do wanna add more channel counts, it's a simple email to sales. Uh, we grab the system ID, issue a new license, punch the code in here, and you've got yourself some new channels to mix with in the background. Rom, could you unshare your screen so we can see Jonathan's screen bigger, please? How is that? Is that okay? Is that okay? That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, the upgrade section here, uh, this is where Ram was talking about ease of upgrade for this unit. Um, you know, USB, but it, it is so much easier to just come in here, um, browse to uh, wherever that latest file is that you keep. Uh, maybe there's a version you like that when you go on site, you load each time because you like it. Um, that's completely up to you, but it's it's that easy. You select the file, let it load. It does a checksum. It makes sure it, it, it verifies it's a good file before it loads it and then it upgrades it. Um, there is some safety built into our upgrade process, so you can go into it with some confidence that uh, even if something does get tripped up during that process, uh, you shouldn't lose any your devices. So don't be afraid to upgrade. 
just um, you know, if you're if you're doing it for the first time, just follow the guides we have online. Super simple stuff. Uh, as far as this maintenance tab goes, I'm going to sync out a little bit. Um, maintenance reset to default. That's your basically flatten the unit. Go back to factory uh, default on the configs. Cleans up all your assignments, all that kind of stuff. Um, reboot is a power cycle. Um, when possible, if you need to reboot the unit or you feel like you want to reboot it, if you can do it through the GUI or through the base itself, we always recommend that versus pulling the power. Um, if you need to pull the power, pull the power. Um, but if you can get to it through a soft reboot here, always preferred since it is uh, computers in the background. Uh, the support info tab here, if you're having any issues, if you're looking at maybe expanding licensing, if you're looking at uh, hey, can someone help me out and look at a couple things on why this might be happening? Go ahead and hit that support info. Hit continue. It's going to wrap up a container for us, all the relevant information for your unit. Um, so when you email support, if you have this ready, we can get the ball rolling on it right away. Uh, back a few moments ago, we were talking about online devices. Does ClearCom have a standard online HelixNet slash free speak that the public can use that you're how do you actually get access to that uh so for the offline editor basically right yeah so which is we, essentially a piece of hardware at your shop right yeah we used to have a few systems stood up for that uh, my understanding is they're being uh, transitioned across departments right now um, so we're definitely keen on getting those back up and, and uh, making sure that there's access to those how that works and what the timeline is for that, I can't give you an answer to, but I know there are a lot of rental companies right now who are making their units available for people who want to jump into them through TeamViewer, uh, maybe configure a base show, help out with um, future planning for something. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see, um, hopefully see some stuff from us in the future, but from other people as well. Well, the thing is, if you probably check with your ClearCom contact, they may be able to set something up for you. Uh, when I was doing the Rio Olympics, we had a base one, an early base, and we wanted to switch it for a base two. And Kari had one available and was arranged to ship it to us overnight FedEx from California to Rio. And while he was waiting for the FedEx guy to arrive, he put it online and I did 99% of the programming on it at, from Rio at his house. And when I got there, I just had to sync up uh, the bell packs and I was I was ready to go. It was perfect. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a, a good note and a good time for us to mention too. Our, our support, we're there for you guys. If you're out in the field and you're, you have a question, um, email support, give them a phone call. Um, there's somebody who's basically always available to help you guys out. So. Um, you know, just shy of, I think Ross video says renting helicopters, um, you know, let us know what's going on and we can probably talk you through it over the phone. If not, we can give you a hook into our system to play around. Um, or like Pete said, if we absolutely need to, we can get your hands on gear some, some way. Uh, the last little bit in here is, uh, just this sync clock button. Um, if you are, if these things sit in rack cases for a while and you're pulling them up and using them, um, you know, one weekend a month, or maybe they've been offline for a long time or sitting, you know, in a closet and you're resurrecting them for another use, or you're putting a brand new system in for the first time. Um, the sync clock is really good. It, it basically just syncs the logging for us. So if there is any issue, we have a, a better idea when you send us timestamps. The other thing it does is it syncs up date and time for licensing. So um, the sync clock can be really helpful last step. So uh, the way this general tab is designed and the way everything in the GUI is designed is it's really kind of a workflow for you and it should be kind of, you know, done in order will help steer you through setting up the system. So general tab, top to bottom. Then we move into our network tab and we've got two options here. Super simple. Pete, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to, when you, as long as you're on this screen right here, if you could talk about connecting multiple bases together and how you get them to talk to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Just to, hang on one second, Jonathan, before you do that, before you move too far away from the soft reboot that you were talking about, yep. I do want to pass along a little power trick to everybody who's listening there. 
if your if your HelixNet master station is installed in a rack and it's hard to get back to the con the power connector to unplug it and replug it if you want to reboot it and you don't have access immediately to the GUI, if you push in the the program audio knob and the uh, and the master volume knob and then at the same time push the middle button on the left hand side that is the um what do you call it the uh H set. The, the headset button yeah if you push those three buttons that little three finger salute will do a soft reboot of your master station uh, and obviously of your whole system as you do that just wanted to pass that along Thank you, Ram. Um, next tab for the net uh, device setup is if you're in the CCM, you've probably already walked through this, but um, you've got the ability for the network to set it static or DHCP. You can set this through the front panel of the unit. Um, so by getting into the CCM, you've probably already looked at the IP from the front panel. Um, I personally am a proponent and a fan of static IPs. Uh, it's just from the, the fields I've been in, and the buildings that I've recently helped build in my broadcast days. Um, but there's also times in my life where I was a big fan of DHCP and um, there's arguments for both. Both are good, both can be bad. Um, it's, it's kind of the, you know, goes back to however you're, you're building your infrastructure and however you de design that system. For me, I like static. And the main reason I like static is so that when we start talking about linking, which is what Pete brought up, we start talking about linking, we start talking about connecting belt packs belt back to a, a main station, we start talking about, you know, kind of organizing our IP subnet, um, it's good to know that this device is always going to live at this IP address. Um, so that when things change on DHCP, which we know they will, we don't have to go chase our tail on it. So for a one weekend show, DHCP can be perfectly fine. If you're doing a, a longer install, a permanent install, um, definitely start thinking static. Um, but really the where these come in is um, is really for the linking and the devices. So the way this linking works is between our HelixNet and our LQ devices, we've got the ability to use what's called our link master and link member protocol. So we can tell this device here, which is our, our HelixNet, to be a link master. We know its IP here is always going to be available for us as long as it's online. So if we look at another device, this is an LQ, it looks very much the same and it's got this same um, section in it. We can change this device to be a link member. When we do that, it's going to ask us, okay, that's fine, but who do you want me to report to um, for, for anything you might need? So we'll give it the IP of that master in the protocol. And it went through and it checked in with our HelixNet system and it said, hey, I'd like to be, you know, a member of your team. I'd like to join the party. And it said, hey, that's perfectly fine. Slot, slot two is available, so let me go ahead and put you in there. So it's telling us, hey, I'm going to go ahead and link you guys together. I'm going to join over IP. I'm going to join you two together so that you can make common channels between each other. And we'll show you how powerful this is once this refreshes. So if we go back to our HelixNet, we go back to our overview screen. Now we can see our HelixNet system. We can also see this LQ. When we scroll down and look at status, we're now seeing account information from that LQ. So if we have a bunch of channels and configurations and accounts and everything set up over here, they're now available to us all from one central configuration manager. Hence CCM. So that's really the, the biggest advantage I think of doing that static is that now when we move this LQ, even if it got a DHCP address, it would still report back in to that master who still lives at its, its permanent address. So again, that debate is really you know design implemented. But uh, while we're talking about link master. We'll show you the accounts in here. Um, so on the HelixNet side, 
we don't have the ability to add agent IC or SIP or um, IVC trunking natively to it. So we can add this LQ to it. And now it gives us the ability to add agent IC. It gives us the ability to add SIP phone lines. And it gives us the ability to connect this IP back to another matrix system. So say we've got a HelixNet that's set up in a, uh, at a live event. We're doing a theater. There's a, a red carpet and a show and a post. And we want to send that back to a TV network. If they've got ClearCom, we can type in a couple accounts here and connect back to their system. The biggest Josh, one we wanted to... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying maybe this might be a good time to uh, ask everybody, if they can, to take their smartphone and go to wherever they get their apps sure. and, and do a search for Agent IC or ClearCom or ClearCom Agent IC, however you want to do it and download that app, it's free, it's not gonna hurt you. And it, what Agent IC is, is for those who don't know, is it's an app for your phone that turns your phone or your tablet or your watch uh, into an intercom panel. Now you can, the, the app is free, where, where it costs money is to buy clients where um, you attach it to an LQ box, or if you have a big matrix system, you can attach it to one of your cards. And then it shows up like this. It's got a bunch of different profiles. And then what you can do is you can hit that start button and you'll actually see the, is this a demo that you're showing? Yeah, you might hear some audio on it as well. Yeah, okay. So this is- This is not a demo, this is an active. This, this is your live one, okay. But it comes out of the box with demo, which will allow you to, to play with, um, with this device. Now, what we're showing you now with Jonathan, he was just telling you about how to attach the Agent IC clients into the system. And this is the actual system itself. You're actually looking at it. So when you, when you create the, the clients, once you've got the licenses on your LQ box that you've entered, now you can create as many uh, of the clients as you're licensed for, give them a label, give them uh, a user ID that will be used for uh, logging in, give it a password or not, you don't have to use a password, but a lot of people like to use that. Give it a role, and again, the role is something we're gonna dive into a little bit more, but give it a role and then assign it to the LQ box that you want it to be in, or it could be assigned to any in the system, in the in the linked system that you have. And once you've established those, you check the box and that that agent IC client is now alive with your system so that your phone is like an intercom panel that you can take anywhere within the Wi-Fi reach of your Wi-Fi router. Or if you've opened up um, a couple of ports, 655 and 80 to the public internet, um, now that goes out in all the LTE devices, so your um, so your wireless um, uh, provider uh, is now allowing your phone to be anywhere where there's uh, where you have phone connection, and you can go to the beach and be on the intercom with your buddies. We can't give you the monitor wall, but we can give you the comms. Jonathan. So just to follow what Ram was talking about is um, for that agent IC device, if we're connected to the same network that our LQ is connected to because it's hosting the license, um, we're able to connect directly to that internal IP address. So if you're on Wi-Fi walking around, it's a good way to add an additional panel or belt pack really if you need to um, without actually having to physically add something. These make for really good listen devices. Um, if we, like Ram said, are on a different location or off site, and we wanna connect back to that LQ, uh, back at somebody's network, um, we're able to grab the static IP or the, the external IP address from that location, um, enter it here, and now that 4G or LTE device can go through the outside internet connection, it can find that exposed IP, and the LQ can uh, help the network hand that information off to it internally. So that's where the setup is um, on that for Agent IC. We get a lot of questions about that. 
Um, so just to recap on it, if it's an internal only connection, you only need the LAN and WAN connectivity, this top portion. If that network is being forwarded to the internet and you wanna be able to break away from that local connection, that's where we'll enter the external connectivity here. Um, if you don't know what the IP is of that network, a simple what's my IP will usually get you in a really good place to start. Um, and then from there, we really just need to make sure that, that we're um, enabling port forwarding. So 6001 is usually a good port. Um, we enable those ports back and forth, and um, now things can talk from outside. Go back to our HelixNet here. So that was the, the linking. Um, and then as far as ports, um, ports is where you'll find those expansion modules. So again, two-wire uh, module offers us two two-wire ports. A four-wire module offers us two four-wire ports here. Uh, Ram talked a little bit about the digital, uh, the introduction of program in a digital format versus um, kind of analog what we're used to. Um, so where that shows up on these physical ports is we're able to say, do we want to enable the program output on this port? Yes or no. We can either mute program on the way out or we can carry it through. Um, so maybe the folks that are on the HelixNet want to hear program, but we're sending that to an LQ or an RTS system over two wire and they don't want program. We can drop it here if we wanted to. Um, standard port settings you guys are used to, input and output gains for the port. Um, Rom, did you want to explain anything further on how the input output gains work as far as the digital mixer goes? Well, you know, just like we discussed in our free speak uh, talk yesterday, the input output gains are from the perspective of the base station. Keeping in mind, the base station is in effect a matrix. So that's into the port and out of the port. And um, you keep in mind also that our um, uh, our um, device here, the 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 two wire ports, because of the nature of two wire, you're only going to get a few decibels plus or minus for the input and output. So you see, you can go plus three or minus three. That's the farthest excursion you can go. Also keep in mind, in the world of two wire, it's pretty good practice to, if I add gain to an input, I want to subtract some gain from the output. And also, after I change gains on a two-wire module, I want to re-null. And of course, reminding you that when you know, you want every endpoint to have their talk buttons not talking, not engaged, not latched. Um, however, on a four-wire module, it gets a little different. On a four-wire module, if you'll highlight one of those, thank you, you'll see a much larger excursion. I can go plus or minus 12 dB, and it's in 6 dB steps here. So they're much more drastic. I have much more flexibility, and the input and the output are totally discrete. So I don't have to play that same game to really tweak my best practices two-wire as I do on a two-wire module. Also, on a two-wire module, obviously, you're going to see there's, um, you know, we, we don't have what we had in the free speak base station, which is we don't have power and we don't have termination. That must come from an outboard power supply or master station. And, um, you know, it can be configured to be ClearCom uh, two wire or RTS two wire. And again, each port would be either from pin two or pin three of the RTS remembering that RTS is going to put two channels of comms on a one three pin XLR. So the first channel would come in on pin two and the second channel would come in on pin three. So each of those ports, uh, when I take um, a connector from, I'm sorry, when I take an XLR from an RTS uh, SAP panel, um, a source assignment panel, it is going to come to me typically with two channels. So I plug it into one of the XLR connectors on the back, and then each of those ports, if I've designated them to be RTS, each of those ports would be, one would be from pin two of the, uh, of the, of the XLR, and one would be from pin three of the XLR. And that way they're kept discrete. So when I go to my assignments uh, page, 
I can assign uh, CC1 and CC2 to discrete channels. And that's where you do it, right there from that drop dropdown. Um, just to remind you, anything that looks like a blue hyperlink is typically something you can change. Um, yeah, there you go. See, I've got remote mic kill, RMK, remote mic kill enabled. That means that I can remote mic kill anything that's coming in or out of my two wire uh, module, and I can select individually the output and the input whether I want to be able to enable the remote mic kill to actuate those things. And of course, down at the very bottom, I could, if I wanted to, enable a GPO trigger with that device. Uh, we don't have the receive call signal like we have on the four wire modules in the um, uh, uh, free speak device. Uh, so that's two wire is just gonna take call signal up or down. Uh, the four wire is not gonna do much with that on the free speak. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, on the HelixNet. Uh, Four wire module. Thank you, sir. Pete, go ahead. One question. Uh, other than all this, I hopefully you're at the end of what you were saying there. Way back where you were saying the little trick about doing a control alt delete on your panel. Did you mean the the main volume control, the program volume control, and the middle button on the left called headset or hot rather. So there's a main volume control yeah. and a program volume control. Hold those two down plus the button labeled hot. H set. Should be labeled H set. Oh, H set. Yeah, I can't read it. Yeah, H set. Yep. Okay. Yeah, H set for okay. headset. That's something that I didn't know. I'm glad to learn that because I always yeah. am cl crawling on back of the rack trying to unplug yeah. the base to reboot it. Thank you. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of people don't um, they don't use the click function on those rotary encoders very often. Anyway, and right? The, yeah, the encoder cover can actually get pushed in a little bit. Uh -huh. um, so if you don't feel those those rotary encoders actually click, just pull the cover off a tiny bit, really gently. And then push it in gently, and you'll feel you'll feel that pot actually click. Yeah, what I usually do in my commando audio class is tell people that if that's the case, like uh, Jonathan just described, and you don't feel that click, pull that uh, that plastic knob off the rotary encoder, take a little piece of paper, make a spitball, and shove it in there to make a shim, so that it sort of it 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 re regrooves the 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 part that has the of the plastic that has that has worn away to be able to make it so you can click that thing. So it's the three finger salute of the main volume, the program volume, and that middle headset. And you hold all three of them at once and you'll see the soft boot happen. Now- What's the uh, ClearCom part number for that repair kit for the knob? Uh, SPT1, yeah. Got it. Got it. <laughs> now, um, our buddy uh, Henry uh, is being cute here, and he's talking about nulling, but he reminds me something that is important to, to I, I, I spoke briefly about it yesterday, but uh, the day before yesterday, but I want to remind everybody. Nulling is vital. Nulling is important. Any, any two-wire circuit that interacts with a four-wire circuit, and all base stations internally are four-wire, they have to be nulled. And to, just to review, every endpoint that's on the channel that you're nulling has to have the talk path turned off. And you only want to know when you've made the topography of your system at least close to where it's going to be. So if I'm going to have 10 or 20 belt packs attached to my two wire system, I want all of them pretty much deployed, plugged in, and the mics turned off, I'm not, the, the talk paths turned off to be able to null that channel. And we also typically we want to tell all the operators, hey, I'm going to know on the channel now. Everybody take your headsets off because they're going to hear some splash tones that can be annoying. Um, it's only a 20 or 30 second process. It's all automatic. It's, it's, it's seamless. It's really good. But remember, if I'm going two wire from my, let's say, free speak belt pack to two wire on my HelixNet, not belt pack, from, from my 
I'm sorry, two wire from my FreeSpeak base station to two wire on my HelixNet base station, I want to null at both ends, and I probably want to do it a couple of times for each channel. One trick that I learned a while ago from our buddy Charlie Button is that when you null an LQ product, you want to make sure to null it again after it's warmed up after about 10 or 15 minutes because the printed circuit board acts a little different on the LQ the way it's designed and it'll it'll pull itself out of null once it comes up to operating temperature. If people on your intercom system complain about their side tone being too loud, in other words, them in their own ears, it's highly likely that you need to null your system. Yep, typically we see it that way. We see it with just echo in general on a two-wire connected circuit. And sometimes in rare cases, but I've seen this, you'll hear some hum or buzz that can be ameliorated with a proper deep null. Would you like me to keep on keeping on, Rob? <laughs> That's this uh, trick. It's where Rom is. Nobody's paying attention to Rom. Yeah. Uh, so the next section for me, um, I know I said the GUI kind of goes in a linear order, but the next section for me I like to do is assignments. Um, I like to get my channel set up next before I start programming endpoints. Um, so I like to go into the channels tab. My preference is show all channels. Um, I just like being able to see kind of the whole layout of what's happening um, and I also like to show all the channels so I uncheck the the hide empty channels here um, big thing for me is it just gives me that kind of grid layout that I'm you know already have in my head and that I'm already kind of thinking about um, we're also, getting a, know, we're getting some comments from people that they can't see your screen so rather than share yeah, it you via your, presenter. your camera let's yeah, make your presenter and share that yeah. screen Kelly sure. And which screen do we want, Pete? Uh, we want Jonathan's screen to be shareable. Jonathan's screen to be shareable. He is a presenter now. Okay, and Jonathan, the little pull down there. We go the, now in the pull down menu under the word show. Go to that pull down menu and select the window where your browser is. Oh, let's see. Right now you're sharing your Firefox. There, there we go. go. That's perfect. Much better. Much better. And you can put turn your camera on to your beautiful face instead. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, at least for me, it, it just makes it, it it's a comfortable view for me to come in, look at all the channels, and hide uh, or, or show all the empties. Um, it gives me a big indicator as I start filling things in that I'm going to run out of channels. Um, so it, it gives me just that that visual again of um, you know keeping things clean. So um, again, like Ram said, anything on this page that's blue, you can click. Uh, if you click it, it'll either do something or tell you to do something. Um, so let's say our our first channel here, we want to be our production PL. So we can go ahead and name this Prod PL blue checkbox here, saves it out. Um, other people might like to keep it by by uh, channel one, channel two, just to keep things consistent with an Excel sheet. Um, I've seen a lot of people do one prod PL. Um, the only thing to keep in mind that um, where this looks really good to you, um, on the screen it's gonna say one dash prod PL. So um, also considering here what you want to show up on a belt pack. So we can do prod PL. Um, we've already got a couple of interfaces in here. Um, we can remove those real quick and easy. Um, so if we're connected to one party line over that two wire port and we want that first channel uh, to be in our prod PL, we can click over on that entity and it will slide it over into the system, create that digital mix for us. We've also got a four wire port connected over to our FreeSpeak2 base, and we wanna make a common PL between those systems. So we can add in 
um, a four wire port from FreeSpeak. So now on this one channel, we've got a party line internal to our Helix net. We've got a party line that exists out on the FreeSpeak 2 or a channel. And we've also got that two wire that's going out to a party line system. So now we've got all three of those systems all talking interface through this one um, Helix net, um, all talking on a common channel. So easy, easy changes there. Um, and this is again, part of the benefit of, of the link, um, using a link membership here, the LQ we added, its interfaces, its physical interfaces on the back also show up for us to configure here. So if that LQ is living in a different part of my house and I wanted to connect a, another analog party line system, I could literally just take this first channel here, add it to my prod PL, and now we've basically got four systems that are all interfaced. So again, easy way to visualize what's happening in that channel. And if we were to turn on belt packs right now and start making talks happen, uh, we would see all them show up in here. So a good visual page. Um, but that's the next for me is, is configuring uh, those channels. You want so, to talk about those red and green arrows? Uh, sure, so the red and green arrows here, as far as what we're looking at for status, and I'll try to zoom in a bit for you. Um, so this is giving us an indicator of the, there, there's a, a connection made between the channel over here and this endpoint. It's showing us the red is that endpoint talking to the channel or passing its audio into the channel. The green indicator is showing us the audio is passing out of that channel to that device. Um, so again, it's a way for us to say, if somebody were to call and say, we're hearing an echo, if if we're seeing you know a ton of red and greens we know we've got a lot of talks and a lot of listens on that channel we can go to those endpoints and start turning talks off we can do a remote mic kill uh, we can start kind of reducing those things um, until we see that go away and then we can take another visual here and say, okay, is that device including nulling the two wire port again correct yep. um, you'll also see call indicator lights here um, so again, just some, some good visual indication from each channel on here. Uh, next step for me then is the roles. Uh, roles are probably where, where most people spend most of their time um, within a HelixNet system. Um, we can talk about the main station because it is nice to have some things to, to slide around with, uh, particularly if you need a change in, in the middle of a show. Um, so we can come into this, the roles here, we can clone this default role to give ourselves, um, you know, a good starting point, or if we wanted to, we could add a role here. We can choose what type of role it's going to be. We'll choose an HMS. We'll call this HMS one. It is for a test and we'll default it off that, um, or we'll base it off the default role. So now we can come in again, anything blue we can change. So we can give this our own role. We can call this Jonathan, because that's what I'm gonna want. Um, now we can come in here and we can start assigning. So key sets are really the most important part here. It's what shows up on the key in front of you. So we can click on it and we can choose which role, um, or uh, sorry, which channel we wanna assign to that key set. Um, so we can set our layout for the, for the station. And then underneath, we can um, control what that key behavior does. Um, so on the HelixNet side, it can either be latching, it can be non-latching, or it can be disabled on that. So when we push the talk key, do we want it to be able to stay on or stay engaged? When we push it, do we want them to have to hold that button the whole time they're talking to us so they don't leave it on in the middle of the show? Or do we want them to not have the ability to talk to that channel? Um, so that's, that's kind of the key behavior there. Underneath is a whole slew of settings. Uh, I'll ask Ram if there's anything he wants to highlight in here. Um, otherwise, we can look at the question list to see if anything has any specifics they want to know about. Well, uh, you we, know, have a, thing, we have. Go ahead. I was going to say one thing that everybody immediately asks is about the menu access. Um, the menu access uh, for typically for a, for a master station, uh, you. I always want to give, enable it and make sure that it's, you know, it's it's available. Um, 
on endpoints like belt packs, that's where you're going to get to, well, do I really want that operator to be able to futz with his uh, settings or not? Um, uh, th that, th at least in the station setting, that's, that's the, probably the, the most commonly asked question. The alt talk key, which is on the front panel of the master station, um, is configurable. So I can configure it. So when I push alt talk, it will only show me the four <coughs> channels that are assigned on the front panel of that device. Or I can make it so that it's going to talk to all 12 or 24, if you buy the license for 24, all the channels. So that's the, those are the two things that probably uh, we get the most questions about on the uh, uh, on the, on the uh, station uh, advanced settings. The, the brightness really doesn't do a whole lot of difference. That the degrees are very subtle, and I don't think anybody really cares about the screensaver name. They just care that it goes involved. Uh, we've got a question from Jim Safrak, and uh, I think what he's saying is, um, he says, what philosophy do you recommend for channel naming since unit display can display channel name only, as in a, a, a assignments name only? Uh, it's very confusing because the stage manager needs to have the lighting name on display and lighting guy needs to have the stage manager name on display. Well, in the Helix Net system, there are no point to points. That's the problem. Uh, that's, it's all that's done. Yeah. It's all done with party lines. So you can't have Bob on your screen and, and, and uh, uh, Jim on your screen. It's just the lighting right. or the stage manager. Right, but, but the way we get around that is we do what I call PPLs, private party lines. So if you've got 12 channels and you're really only using nine of them, you've still got three or four channels available that you can make True. Uh, the John and Ron channel or the- True, uh, but, but my, my experience is 12 gets used up really fast on a show. I mean, yeah, you're, well, in you know, terms of your normal PL. However, well, in unlike, like the free speak system, you can do belt pack to belt pack talks. Right, and, you can't do it in Helix then. If, you, yeah. you, if you're connected to an Eclipse system, you can do a panel right. button to a free right. speak, but right. Helix Net has a limitation that way. Right, so you know what you need to do is cozy up to whoever spends the money in where you work and get them to pony up the 500 bucks to go to uh, um, 24 channels, which is- exactly. Uh, Exactly. They're still going to get filled up. Yeah. No, well, 24, 24 is much more reasonable for a show because then you will have a party line which you can artificially name as a private channel just with the two of you on it. Yep. In my personal experience, too, always better to keep the stage manager happy over lighting, but I'll let you just sign up on that one. <laughs> Well, there, there we go. So, so there is an on the belt packs. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't it default to call on the? No, that's on the free speak belt packs, isn't it? Yeah, that's free yeah, speak. You, if you can have yeah, that. You, you do there's not a, have to put a, a hard call you, on on the on the helix. Right. Belt packs, you right. do not have to put a, a a name on the channel. Uh, well, actually, it has to have some name in it. It can't be blank. Yeah. Right, channel or one, channel two, or one. Can't be blank, but you don't have to put it anywhere. If you're not using it, you don't have to put it in any panels. Right. Yep. Uh, so the next role we can look at, if you guys want to keep moving, I didn't see any other questions in the queue right now. Uh, yeah, is there a non-option for a channel? Yes, there is a non-option. This is Mac. I just want to make a point about that naming thing. Sure. Uh, if you're making a, a uh, if you're simulating a point to point by making another PL, it, it can only have one name, so it can't have different right. names at each end. But all you no, have to but, do is all you have to do is call it private. You can because yeah. there's only the that's the only two people on it. Right. And yep. and and uh, you know you could have lots of channels. I mean, it might be confusing on the management level, but on the user level, you could have lots of channels. They're called private. Right, right. Yeah, that so are just PLs. Yeah, so, they go to, to yeah, two people. Was, yeah, if there was a scenario where where Ram and I both needed to hear something private from somebody, um, we could both have a destination, basically our channel, on our endpoint, 
that says John, and we could assign John to somebody's belt pack, they could talk directly to that channel and I would be the only one listening to it. Um, but you're right, it is, it's a party line. So it's really up to um, your creativity on how you want to organize that. There's one more in here. Is there a none option for a channel? Yes. So if we want to blank a channel out, we can actually click on it. Um, click on the selected channel and it will go away and it will show us unassigned. Um, so yeah, if you do only have two channels on a main station or if you only want one on a belt pack and you don't want any mess ups, then uh, yeah, you can you can blank those out. Can you set a belt pack on a channel to have more power than others? Like the stage manager's mic is louder than other people's. Uh, yeah, you can actually. So um, since the- but within limited within limited ranges. Right, yep. So um, it all goes into the system tuning. So since it's a belt pack, um, the belt pack roles are very much the same um, as designing for a main station or on the free speak side. Um, where we're going to get to those level controls um, is really going to be um, kind of in the input output of the channel. There's really not a lot in Helix let, that lets us, um, but we do have some headroom here. We have a contour filter. Um, and I think that's really all we're going to have. What does, what does the headroom do? It's just basically normal and high, but what does that do? Rob, okay. you that yeah, absolutely. So when we first came out with this, um, uh, Jim Rizgin came up to Montreal and was playing around with the system, and he took it out to a um, Detroit car show where the um, the stage manager happened to be sitting right next to the monitor mixer who had monitors blasting. And... So the stage manager, because the ambient sound around her was so loud, was speaking very loudly. And what happens is the the, the gain stage is a, is is a stack of digital gain stage, analog gain stage. Well, actually, it's analog, digital, analog, digital, analog. And what would happen is the digital gain stages would be overwhelmed and turn the uh, signal into hash by the time it reached the next analog. And then the analog would truly pass along crappy audio to the next stage. So what we did is we, we did this thing called headroom where what it would do, it, was, it would allow more headroom to that gain stage but because of that and the way the compression was working, it also raised the noise floor, which in a loud environment really doesn't make that much of a difference because there's so much ambient noise surrounding you that um, you're not really hearing it. It's not so critical. But when you're you know, well, quiet, you know, everybody knows how quiet uh, the Helix set can be. Some people even complained about it that they didn't really know whether it was on or not. So, so when it's a quiet so, environment... So you, so there's really no way to turn the gain up of a belt packs mic. Well, it well no, there is not, and that was other big. than maybe the dynamic zero and dynamic minus twelve button. Yeah, dynamic whoa. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's some there's some headphone gain, but there's no mic gain. There, well, there's a mic. The headphone gain yeah. doesn't help you though, right? No, right. not at all. So, Unlike in free speak, where if one person is talking too loud, you can turn their individual input to the system down. Right. In Helix, even if you only assign one role to one bell pack, you have no way to control their mic. Yeah, we used to have it, and we got into a lot of trouble because people were making these gigantic excursions, and Charlie Button put his foot down and said, there are standards in microphones that are on headsets. Let's let them be the arbiter of this, and people can talk louder or softer. You know, you can make Unfortunately, the Unfortunately, we don't have standards in people the way people talk. I, I don't disagree with you. However, because this was the emphasis on this product was for the two-wire connectivity to be able to interconnect with the two-wire connectivity. There, the way it went round and round between product manager and, and engineering is they just decided to take that function out right. of the software. Okay. Um, one other little question. We have two things we'd love to be able to cover a little bit before we end, and we're pretty much at the end of our time now, but um, first of all, is there a way to stack keys on the HelixNet? 
If I want uh, yes. to have yep, two yep. talk buttons on one key, how do I do that? Yep, so the, the first part here is if we go to our role, we want to enable stat key on that channel. So we'll enable that. And then uh, we can give this uh, a stat key label if we want to, but then we can come in and we can choose multiple channels. Perfect. So again, it's Good. enabling the stat key and then assigning in the role. Keys. Right. Yep. And it's in the role and it's per key. And it has yeah. a unique name for that stack. Yep. So it can be, yep. okay, great. Yeah. Secondly, yep. secondly, can we just go a little bit directly into the LQ yep. itself? So uh, I saw that question, Frankie, LQ, and the reason we didn't jump right to the GUI is it's very much the same um, as your HelixNet um, to the point where when you link them, you can actually control one with the other. So um, as far as the look of these, uh, they're gonna look incredibly um, incredibly the same or similar. So um, let me dump out of here so you can see it standalone on its own since it does look a little different. I think probably everybody wants to hear about Agent IC, so let's jump right into that. Um, so same layout here, network linking ports, that's all the same as what we saw in HelixNet. Where we get different here and what we can allow is Agent IC, which I'm sure is what every, it's on everybody's mind right now. Um, so we come in first into our device and we license it. We can do this offline or we can do it um, online. So if you're connected to the internet, super easy, type your passcode. If not, a little back door, but we can help you out. Then we go into our accounts and we set up an account. So the account is what I'm gonna use on my phone to log into the system. So I set up this account here to find those parameters. And now I'm gonna to go to a role and I'm gonna set up a role just like I would for a belt pack, just like I would for a HelixNet remote station, uh, just like I would for a FreeSpeak belt pack or a FreeSpeak base. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, if I want to add a new role, uh, we can make a role specifically for Pete. So if we're having, you know, another meeting later, I can give Pete access to my system. Um, I can come in here if I want to, and I can add more key sets. So if I want to, I can put 12 key sets on here. Um, and it's it's the exact same. I can go through and I can assign, um, I can assign this key set um, based off where where I want it in the system. So. 12 channels with 12 key sets is a, it's going to be a one for one relationship on here. They're all in use right now. Um, but again, I do have a little bit of control over here too. So I can say, what do I want my left um, primary key to be? Do I want it to be a call, a talk, a listen, um, a remote mic kill? Um, I can also change the uh, right keys and I can do secondaries on both of those. So when I tap in the app and I flip something over, um, oh, looks like it's overlaid. Um, and I flip something over within the app, I can have a secondary function on there. Um, so it creates a panel that's very, very comfortable to what you're already used to uh, being at your fingertips. Um, so then on Agent IC, when you log in, and let me see if I can get that shared. It's a VM, so we'll see. All right, so this is a Android emulator, uh, but you can see the same thing. So when I go in for my setup here, um, I put my username in that, that matches directly with what I set back up in my account. I put my password in, I type in either my internal LQ address, if I'm on my internal Wi-Fi or LAN, or the external address, if I set that up in the LQ ahead of time. Uh, if I'm over on LTE or, or 4G network. Um, and then the LQ port, again, just helps with the TCP and UDP port forwarding going back and forth. So I set those few parameters up. I come back to my menu, I click start. And if everything's happy, comes right in. And you guys are probably hearing some audio from Michigan State Broadcasting. Um, so that's that's the simplicity really of Agent IC. And again, it's it's not only great for remote work, it's not only great for um, when you need to be in another building for one show, it's also great when you're on the floor and somebody shows up and says, hey, the executive uh, is here, 
he wants to listen to the production, uh, get out another belt pack or give him a station to listen to, and you don't have time to go find a biscuit, get it cabled in, re-null the system, but you know you've got your LQ sitting over there and you can just give him this login for his phone and you really don't have to accommodate much. Um, so it's a great way to expand and a great way to allow that remote connectivity. And it's very programmable. So for the executive, you just give them a listen, not a talk. Right. And that way you don't have to worry about them stepping on the production during the show. Uh, I know I've used LQ boxes over the public internet between them, but you can't do that to a HelixNet base, correct? Uh, going out to the internet? That's correct. Correct. Oh. That's correct. Yep. Everything needs so to be the, local for that. So unit. the network, the network in the Helix Net has to be in your local network. However, yeah. if I'm just two LQ boxes, they can be across the world from each other. They can. Yeah. So and and when you when you connect the LQ to and and make a Helix Net the master, the LQ kind of dumbs down to it. it. The codec sort of goes back to that 722 instead of the uh, Opus. And the um, yeah, you, it the the other so thing the, about the, the only the way is to take in two LQs on the internet and using four wire connect to your HelixNet system. Right, right, exactly. Right. You could do it that way. Uh, but right. keep in mind also one thing we didn't mention is that the HelixNet is you know it's it's more than ten year old technology and you know things are moving at leaps and bounds nowadays. Um, it was designed to work with a 10100 switch, which we thought was the bee's knees back then. Um, so if your switch uh, is not going to detect that, you're going to have to physically want to dumb it down to be able to play nice and not jack up traffic. And to answer Jan's question here about ports, um, by default, it likes to use 6001. Uh, it is a TCP and UDP protocol. Um, but you can change that, it's configurable. So if we look again um, back at network, uh, we can set our external port um, really to be whatever is available on your network. So obviously you're not gonna use anything like SSH or those common HTML protocols, um, but if IT is telling you, hey, we can forward this port to that port, um, we can definitely accommodate that, so. Uh, how much are ICE agent IC licenses? Uh, we don't work in sales, Jeff, so we really don't talk numbers on it, um, but most of that information should be available online. Uh, Rom, if you're comfortable answering it, feel free. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. I think they're around 400 or 450 or 500. I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Uh, per client, um, I know that if you, on one LQ box, you can have up to eight L, uh, agent IC clients, um, but if you, let's say you needed 10, you could buy five for one box, five for another box, and once they're linked together, all of them are talking to each other. Right. Um, but I know that if you buy eight, you do get a price break. Uh, you can also, the, the SIP licenses for, uh, you know, the digital phone systems are come in, come in a block of eight. It, it doesn't come broken down a la carte. Um, so those are the things I know. Uh, again, they don't let us really too near the price sheet because they know we'd give it all away anyway. So uh, uh, sorry, I don't have accurate, up-to-date information for you, but you can find that out easily. Uh, let's go ahead, Kelly. Well, just uh, seeing how you guys were feeling and, uh, you know, if you want to take maybe just a couple more, obviously L the, uh, the LQ box is uh, is a pretty powerful tool. I've seen some yeah. neat applications with uh, seeing a lot of vendors uh, putting that in their uh, engineering racks for cameras uh, to do four wire uh, to extend HelixNet out and it's working just brilliantly. Obviously, the, the, the uh, over the internet is... <laughs> You know, our, our networks just seem to get bigger and bigger and people want to connect from everywhere. And uh, this is a, a really timely uh, topic, I think, uh, yeah. in terms of, of the LQ and the, and the box. It's coming in at that time. Uh, hey, Pete, 
Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts? I want to be mindful of uh, these guys' time. Uh, you know, before we start, uh, any other questions that uh, we want to get in before? I think I think, I think well, there are no questions waiting. Uh, unless all of a sudden somebody wants to know something, but um, uh, I think we've kind of covered it pretty well. Uh, uh, one of the things I used also on LQ when I'm just using it alone is uh, putting stuff in their own assignments as well within the LQ to create a mix minus of four wires for my cameras with one input. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I took it. I took an eight-port LQ, four wire, not on the network. One of them went to a Riedel system, actually, and the other six ports, I just made a party line inside the LQ, put them all in the party line, which made mix minuses for all the four wires for the cameras. And By the way, really nice. A really cool trick that you can do in that regard is you can actually bring two party lines in. Let's say if you have a three or four camera shoot bring two uh, party lines in, one being the camera conference and right. the other one being an engineering. And then all you do is yep. point and click and then you can take, let's you say- You can change it, right. Yep. Camera three has a back focus problem and wants to talk directly to the shader. Yep. And that way they're not gacking up the, the, the director who's most likely a prima donna and doesn't want to hear that kind of talk on his channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Mac and I worked on a show where we thought we'd want to, we, we, we were using sort of Readle VOIP between two sites, and we were using uh, embedded audio on video between two different sites. And we thought, why don't we just throw a bunch of LQ boxes in there and use that? And they gave us a great network between the two sites. Why not? Yeah, yeah we had a gigabit. A much cleaner way, much cleaner way to use LQ boxes. Absolutely. So, you know, I, Ram and Jonathan, thanks so much for for dropping everything. <laughs> this week and you know when when free speak went long you know we got out we hung up and we're like all right everybody's digging this when can you do this next right and um i we're we're tasking everybody's system right now um you know uh half the time i'm on the email trying to figure out what our next session's going to be because um there's a lot of interest out there right now there's a lot of people listening um obviously they have your contact info uh, and as the applications, guys, we really appreciate your job you do in the field. Um, well, we, we appreciate know. the appreciation. And let me just make a, you know, a, uh, a shameless uh, little pitch. Uh, www.clearcom.com uh, in, the, in the support drop down menu of our website, we have something called Solution Finder. And it is an incredible treasure trove of cool things that you can you just type in any question. How do I connect a, a ClearCom LQ to a RTS Arvon? I don't know if you can't really do that, but if you could, you'd find it there. It's a great resource. Also, uh, I know that uh, we're gonna put up our email addresses and you're happy to ping us anytime you want and let us know uh, what your questions are. We're here for you. That's our uh, raison d'etre, as they say, in the, places other than here. And speaking of places other than here, making making another shameless pitch, uh, if you don't mind me doing that, Kelly, to- Absolutely, uh, go right that, ahead. That, that we're going to do some late night ones coming up, as we mentioned earlier, to be able to accommodate our friends in the um, European, Middle East, African market, and Asia Pacific market. So if, and I know many of us do, if you have any buds who uh, are in that area, let them know about www.practicalshow.tech uh, and uh, they can find all these webinars and also the, pre the, the ones we've already recorded. And also I do wanna say that the ClearCom website has plenty of uh, videos in the support section that can help you out. Look, these times are tough. We've been through them. We know what it's like. We do come out the other end. This one is a little bit more weird than anyone we've ever seen, but it's going to end and we're going to get back to work. And those of us who are staying sharp are going to get the first calls coming back. And we're here to support you. We want to make you look good. We like the fact that you make our stuff look good, but for us, it's more important that you look good so that you can continue to make us look good. You know, uh, the more you know, the less you fear. 
and the less quicksand you step into. So uh, not only here, but everywhere, all these webinars, it's worth your time. And we really encourage you to, to work hard while we're sitting around and stay off Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know what? In, I don't think you can say any better. Pete, go right ahead. In the normal course of work that we all used to work in, uh, in the olden days, uh, when we're not locked in with a guard sitting out our front door, two weeks um, ago, we never had time to do this kind of stuff. And I have to thank Kelly for coming up with this idea. It's, you know, we're sitting around going like this. I've, I've binge watched two different series already, and I'm getting a little tired of the TV. So I'd rather look at this TV to all of you and talk to all these different things. It's almost like being on a show backstage, but not quite. Almost. Um, and yeah, hey, Pete, scroll up on your page for a second so we can talk about tomorrow's session. Um, the uh, uh, Pete's got his paperwork show prep. That is tomorrow's lunch with Pete. Pete's buying lunch tomorrow. Uh, we're not sure what's on the menu other than label makers and a lot of paper, I am sure, virtually. Um, but we, uh, we again, so much. Um, I'd like to thank Clearcom Corporate. Um, this uh, they've they've stepped up, given you guys access or given us access to you, and we really appreciate that. Their commitment to education is second to none, and um, I think in today's world, what we're experiencing, um, you, you can't beat education. It doesn't matter how old you are, um, and uh, I won't comment about any of the age of the screen here. And uh, at this point, I think we'll call it a day. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you for um, for uh, all your comments. Keep them coming in. We'll keep throwing shows together as quickly as we can. Thanks and have a great night.